Um, so we have delved in depth into the different areas of child protection violations and where poverty appears to have an important role and where it doesn't. Um, we've done this through two two processes, um, an in-depth review of literature looking at the relationship between poverty and child protection violations in the areas of physical and sexual violence against children, inadequate care and early marriage, and through a systematic review of programmes, both those that did and didn't include economic strengthening components to look at where those added value and where they didn't. So um, unlike many systematic reviews that look at one thing and see whether it's good or not, we tried to compare um, economic strengthening initiatives with other kinds of initiatives. And that was methodologically difficult to do, um, but it did mean that we were able to contextualise and put the economic strengthening um, insights in a, in a set of wider policies. Um, as far as we're aware, we have done the first synthesis on the impact of economic strengthening programmes on um, sexual and physical violence against children and inadequate care. And we've added to um, the range of, st of studies that have been covered in synthesis of the impact of economic strengthening on early marriage. And we've generated some granular insights of what works on different issues and with different groups. Um, as I said, with the um, economic strength and initiatives, we try to look at both sides of the coin, both you know, where do they make a difference and how, and also what problems does it cause if there isn't any attention to poverty or economic strengthening within an initiative. So what did we find about the relationship <coughs> between household poverty and protection violations? Well, the the issues that are on the top of the slide, we found that there was a stronger relationship with um, household poverty, so early marriage, sex exploit exploitation, exposure to neighbourhood violence, inadequate care. But for some things, that there is much less clear evidence of relationship. There is often some, some evidence of relationship, but the evidence is mixed and it's inconclusive. So some studies do find a relationship between physical violence against children and household poverty, but a lot don't. Um, and the same with sexual abuse. This summarises then the, the, all the areas of child protection violations we looked at and sort of schematically shows what we found in terms of the extent of the, the relationship. Um, I think it's important to say with all of these things that poverty is never the only factor. Um, social norms have an enormous influence on how people think the right way to engage with children is, how the right way to, to, to bring them up the role of violence within that, whether it's at what age it's okay to leave a child in the care of another child, um, and so on. All of those are really important factors. And so is the, the absence of effective structures for protecting children, um, and structures which in some times um, actually compound the violence against children. For example, in you know, traditional systems whereby um, if a girl's been been raped, then she, she is married off often against her will, um, but that's sort of seen as um, an acceptable way of, of resolving the situation in the eyes of, of many older people, and the girl has no say in it. Um, but the focus of this meeting is about the role of poverty, so I just wanted to put on the agenda that you know we by no means think it's the only factor, but I'm, I'm now going to focus on it. So how does economic deprivation um, increase children's risk of, of protection violations? Well, firstly, through survival strategies, such as... Um, marrying off a daughter because you don't have enough money to, to feed her or encouraging a girl to go out and um, you know, get some money for her school fees through transactional sex. And of course that may be a young person's own decision as well. It's not only parents forcing their children to do these things. You know, there, there are many people involved in, in making decisions on these things. I think also m less recognised exposure to such in it's the situations where exploitation and abuse can occur. So I think you know what we've seen um, in evidence from India in the last couple of <coughs> years about how, for example, you know, young um, women and girls having to use communal toilets in, in um, urban areas where there's no proper sanitation are at much greater risk of, of um, sexual violence um, while using those toilets. And of course, you know, poorer children are typically walking perhaps unaccompanied or in small groups to, to school if they're even attending and are at risk of violence on the way. 
And then, um, interestingly, the evidence that we've looked at shows a strong relationship between attending school um, and um, less risk of sexual violence, which is interesting because obviously there is a lot of qualitative evidence too and some quantitative evidence of the extent to which in some schools you know, sexual violence, harassment by teachers, harassment by other students is a problem. And you know, in some contexts, there's also um, a high degree of corporal punishment. But nonetheless, overall, the evidence seems to indicate that attending school does reduce um, children's risk of sexual exploitation. And um, our study was also looking at inadequate care and, in, in, and inadequate care of younger children. On your handout, you should have a, a set of definitions. Um, basically, we defined inadequate care as care that didn't meet children's uh, physical and emotional um, developmental needs. Um, obviously, where children were being left without um, competent adult care, then um, they're very much more at risk of accidents and of various other um, developmental damage. And um, nurseries can play an important role in that, um, but of course are very inaccessible in to poor people in the majority of cases. So our systematic style review of um, interventions, which I conducted with my colleague Ella over there wearing the blue cardigan, um, we did a very extensive search and um, whittled down over a thousand studies down ultimately to 83 studies. Um, we excluded them either because they were not relevant or because they didn't meet methodological standards. Um, and you can see that the majority of studies we looked at were in sub-Saharan Africa and um, the rest uh, distributed across other continents with, with a few from Central and Eastern Europe and uh, very few from the Middle East and North Africa. So we looked at programs that, um, as I said earlier, both had economic strengthening components and those that didn't. The ones that the main economic strengthening components were cash transfers, in-kind <coughs> transfers, vocational training, and microfinance. Um, and there were these were typically programs that also involved a whole set of other activities too, such as life skills um, or non-formal education for young people, awareness raising for adults, um, you know, trying to convince them um, not to marry off their daughters or not to hit their children. Um, some programs which facilitated access to services um, by supporting um, children to attend, either by making the service physically more available or by paying cash transfers or providing uniforms that let children attend school. Um, and we also looked at a wider set of child protection system strengthen, system strengthening initiatives that were working with police or social workers, um, typically trying to build capacity to respond supportively to children and families in situations of violence and abuse. Um, we found that it was very much more common for the early marriage interventions to have economic strengthening components um, than the other sets of than the interventions addressing other sets of issues. I think this reflects the fact that you know there is a strong consensus that poverty is an important driver of early marriage, whereas on the other issues, there's much less consensus. On the physical violence, um, pretty much all the projects that we looked at that had economic strengthening components were ones that were trying to prevent young people getting involved in gangs and um, sort of community level, neighborhood level violence or were helping young people exit from those. So they weren't trying to say, um, you know, pay cash transfers and combine that with a, with a project <coughs> educating parents to, to not hit their children, for example. It was all very much about that community level violence. Um, the sexual violence ones, they were largely to do with, um, they were adolescent empowerment programs really, largely focused on girls um, trying to build livelihood activities and often, you know, life skills and to help girls not engage in transactional sex and also provide information on their rights. So that, I mean, some of the more successful programs, for example, combined um, helping girls develop economic assets such as savings or small businesses with education on their rights under the law, that their right to, to say no, their right to not be forced into marriage, um, what they could do if they were raped. I'll, um, oh, just to just one previous point on that slide, it was also very noticeable that how few programs 
targeted um, the parents of children and young people. Almost all of them really were targeting the young people themselves um, directly. And I mean, while there's a good argument for that in that they were, they were also aiming to empower young people, perhaps there's something being missed there about strengthening household livelihoods mm -hmm. so that um, families are in less stressful situations or less dependent on livelihood strategies that force their children into um, situations that put their protection rights at risk. So how did the economic strengthening components help reduce the child protection violations? Well, three main routes really for which we had good evidence. Um, helping young people develop livelihood skills um, and generate more income, which increased their standing within their households and ability to negotiate around things like early marriage or to say, no, okay, I, I don't need to... Um, you know, have a transactional relationship to pay my school fees uh, because I, I've got a bit more money from this chicken business. Um, they help girls to stay in school, which, you know, at the macro level is protective against transactional sex and early marriage. And um, they also attracted young people into programs. They were almost like a loss leader in a way, in that parents who would otherwise have been reluctant to particularly to let their daughters participate. Um, saw the value of the programs because the, the girls were learning a viable skill, whether it was tailoring or, you know, I don't know, beautitianship. They were mostly gender-typed activities. So they weren't tending to teach girls carpentry and things like that, but they were, they were anyway, um, providing skills that people saw as useful. Um, and then taking part in the programs, the girls were exposed to a wider, you know, a, a different attitudes, <coughs> um, knowledge about their rights and so on. Um, I'm talking about girls a lot. It's very noticeable how few of the programs really worked with adolescent boys. It was typically only the set that worked to try and prevent young people being involved in gang violence that worked with young men. And a few of the adolescent development programs um, had both um, boys and girls in it, but the majority were focused on, on girls. Um, there are some other pathways by which... Um, economic strengthening activities might reduce um, child protection violations, um, but we found very little evidence of these. So really this is speculation and some things that require further research than anything else. We also found that lack of attention to household poverty was undermining some of the protection initiatives. So for example, initiatives around accident prevention um, often involved people doing things that they just couldn't afford. Um, and so they weren't able to buy protective equipment. Some of the more successful programs did enable pe people to make adjustments within their, their homes that, you know, meant put, putting a, a stove somewhere out of reach of a child or hanging up medicine in a place they couldn't get it. But, um, but this, it did undermine the, um, those initiatives. And likewise, some of the protection system strengthening initiatives were not really engaging with the fact that people simply couldn't afford to access the justice system. Um, because of the cost of bus fares or the cost of paying court fees and bribes and so on, e even where they did have confidence in the system, you know, where they thought that this was something that should come to law and should come to court but simply couldn't afford to do anything about it. Um, did they add value? Um, well, few studies compared the impacts of economic strengthening with other approaches. Yeah. We can say that there were some clear positive impacts, certainly not a magic bullet because poverty is never the only issue involved. Um, they appeared to work better when they were part of combined programs addressing attitude and norm change as well. And where they built on established good practice, um, clearly you know, a, a poor quality vocational training program is not going to help young people um, protection at all, but where it's a higher quality one that's linked into demand for skills and so on, um, then there's got a much better chance of doing so. Um, and in fact I'll stop there because we're going to pick on the implications at the end after the other two presentations. <laughs>